Greetings from Allegheny Mennonite Conference and Community Mennonite Church in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I'm Pastor Jennifer Davis Sensenig, and Lesson 9 from Participating with God in Awe comes from the book of Revelation. As a pastor, I have taught and preached from Revelation over a few decades, and it usually requires making my approach to this New Testament book explicit, sometimes even directly countering other approaches circulating in our culture of Bible readers. Since our lesson is focused on chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, which is a description of worship, I would probably begin a session by saying that Revelation is a book of the Bible laced with worship. John, exiled on the island of Patmos, had visions of worship in the throne room of God. At the beginning of the letter, John says in chapter 1, verse 9, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. As suggested in the opening part of this session, a conversation about your congregation's visual environment for worship is a really fitting way to begin this session. Encourage people to share what different aspects of your visual environment mean to them. Which objects help them turn their attention toward God? In the building where our congregation worships, We installed a round stained glass window of a tree, and periodically we hear different preachers, worship leaders, and members of the congregation reflect on what this image means to them as they come for worship. Turning to Revelation, I suggest that your group maybe pages through the book of Revelation in their Bibles, noticing the many sections that are set out like poetry, you know, where it's... uh, center justified instead of uh, in solid columns. These are usually indications of hymns and worship materials in the book of Revelation. These ancient worship resources are designed to equip seven congregations in Asia Minor, congregations of believers, for resisting the sway of the Roman Empire and remaining loyal to Jesus Christ. These worship materials often depict Jesus as the lamb who did not kill his enemies, but triumphed over them, conquered them through love, even to the point of death. Because Jesus as the lamb was raised in resurrection life and now reigns over all, these are exuberant psalms of praise. The promise of this letter is Even if we live in a world where evil seems to be in charge, sometimes looking like an earthly beast or a cosmic dragon disguised as an empire, Babylon or Rome, we recognize the reign of God. Furthermore, in time, many nations will turn toward the lamb on the throne. For now, living faithfully amidst the oppression and temptation of empire, requires robust faith, powerful worship, and patient endurance. The imagery of revelation that seems fantastical, disturbing, and often opaque for us today was very clear to the believers who first received this letter. They knew something about apocalyptic literature. In our last lesson, we referred to repetition in biblical narrative. Our passage today also includes repetition, but in the form of biblical poetry. Notice how often the word hallelujah is repeated in this passage. Hallelujah means praise Yahweh. It's repeated four times, and hallelujah appears more than 30 times in the Psalms. Are there other ways in which Revelation 19 reminds you of any of the Psalms? I don't know about you, but sometimes there's somebody in our group who really likes to read the footnotes and references in their Bible during a class session. If you have that person, ask them to share some of the Psalms that are listed as allusions in this uh, passage from Revelation. My point is just that, you know, like in hip-hop music, Revelation 19 is 
a new psalm. It's a new song for the seven churches, but it samples a lot of material from music that the group already knew from other psalms. So you might want to check that out. In addition to repetition and sampling the psalms, in this passage, we also have an example of contrasting parallelism. The great whore in verse 2 is contrasted with the bride of verse 7. And here's a big problem. This passage ought to come with an R rating, or at least a strong warning. These two caricatures of women, the whore and the bride, and also the praises in verse 3 over the demise of the whore, are offensive rhetoric, especially for peace churches who are committed to dismantling patriarchy, especially for women who are survivors of abuse, and especially for societies like ours where violence against women is sometimes justified or ignored by authorities who should hold perpetrators accountable. This is true of both governments and church institutions. I consider it part of our shared responsibility as teachers in the church to both acknowledge the dangers of patriarchal texts and contexts and to do our best to discover and proclaim the gospel from the scriptures through the person of Jesus Christ for the times that we're living in today. This is a big job. So I'm glad we're in this together. And I believe the spirit of Christ can move us beyond our fears. By including two metaphorical women, the whore of Babylon and the bride of the lamb, John is following in the footsteps of ancient prophets who pictured God as a loyal husband and Israel as a sometimes unfaithful wife. In Revelation, the bride is the church who has been faithful to Jesus Christ with public acts of justice and righteousness that everyone can see. The church's just and righteous behavior is like, well, it's like fine linen clothing, the beautiful garments for a wedding feast. Still, the caricatures of women as utterly immoral or perfectly pure can be harmful to actual women in our groups, especially when we're struggling with our self-image or our relationship with Christ and the church. This year, for the first time, I'm reading through the Inclusive Bible, a translation effort among Roman Catholics interested in dismantling patriarchal harms in their scriptures and in their worship life. The translators recognize that many of us Christians from other streams of the church have a shared interest. Rather than the whore of Babylon, the inclusive Bible uses the term the great idolater. And rather than bride, it uses betrothed. I find these translations helpful because they dislodge these metaphors from a particular gender and still fit the analogy John is making. John wants the seven churches to see the sharp contrast between worship of the empire and worship of Christ the Lamb. And John wants the churches to make a choice to be loyal to the way of Jesus, the way marriage partners make vows. In the Connect and Transform section of your lesson, Michael Paul, the writer, has some very helpful statements about God's judgment against evil. If I were teaching this lesson, I would take time to read these aloud as a group. I might add that when faith communities become reluctant to recognize and honor God as the just judge over history, we're tempted to justify or ignore violence, oppression, and exploitation. Revelation shows us that the God who intends shalom for all creation works uniquely through the lamb who was slain. Yes, in Revelation, God's judgment against imperial oppression is described with violent images against the great idolater. And the church's response is a psalm of praise. Don't be afraid as a teacher to wade into this difficult topic. 
you don't necessarily need all the answers. As scattered churches today, how does our worship life connect with our public witness against evils of our societies?